Over the past several months, we've talked to a number of different charities and nonprofits sponsored by Share Detroit, where you can learn more information on sharedetroit.org. That includes now uh, one of these organizations, uh, the Living and Learning Enrichment Center, whose executive director and founder, Ra uh, Rochelle Vertanian, joins us now on the Megacast. Rochelle, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate having you on. So tell us a little bit about your organization and uh, its mission and some of the work that it does in our community. Okay, um, so the name of my organization is Living and Learning Enrichment Center, and we work with teens and adults and seniors who have special needs. When we first opened in 2015, we were really focused on autism, people that were older and had autism, and it's just um, organically um, has gone in the direction that we just, we work with everyone now. And so it's 13 and older. We have uh, classes um, for senior citizens that have special needs. We have summer camps, we have vocational programs, we do job skills. We uh, we currently have nine people on our payroll that has special needs. Um, and our goal is to help people live as independently as possible. And a lot of these opportunities, uh, particularly on the on the educational side, especially today with the challenges uh, that are inherent in education because of our modern society, of course, because of the crisis that we continue to be in uh, with COVID-19, how much more, especially over the last roughly two years or so uh, that we've been dealing with COVID-19, how much more important have these opportunities and these programs in particular uh, been to those with special needs in our community to continue their education, to broaden their education, and to provide those critical opportunities, especially for those uh, that are going out into the workforce and are going out into their independence? Yeah, it, very, very important. Um, I don't want to stereotype and say, you know, all people with autism like to be alone or, but I mean, I, I do see that a lot that they want their, you know, need some private time. So giving them, you know, for the last two years of, you know, isolation and I mean, it is really fed into this. And I hear from a lot of parents that, you know, I, I can't get them out of the house now, you know, so, you know, it's, it's really affected a lot of them. We've had um, one of our clients passed away from COVID. Um, you know, when we first, was it 2020, we did summer camp and no one was doing summer camp. We, we knew we had to. So we, you know, checked uh, temperatures every day and, you know, we're in the mask and, you know, everything else, put every precaution there was in there. And we kept it outside just to give them some normalcy in their life. You know, um, what tends to happen with, people with special needs is that when they're done with high school, it's like they've fallen off a cliff and there's nothing out there for them. And that's where we really focused on this. So the other thing we did is the day it was mandated that everyone had to stay home, we went virtual that the next day. Um, and a lot of organizations didn't do that. And um, it wasn't perfect. I mean, it, you know, socializing virtually, it's not perfect, but it was something for them. And now the numbers are going up again, but you know, a couple of months ago we were, you know, at our highest uh, capacity um, because people really need this. We're joined by Rochelle Vartanian, the founder and executive director, uh, no, the founder and the executive director of, Li of the Living and Learning Enrichment Center joining us on the Megacast. And of course, you founded the organization uh, in 2015. We talked about its goals and its mission, some of the programs uh, that are featured there. What was your inspiration behind finding uh, this organization in particular? Okay, well, um, in another life, <laughs> I was a special ed teacher for 20 years. I worked with um, young adults um, who had severe behavioral issues. So right out of college, I worked at a lockup center and that was for whatever crazy reason, my passion, I, I was in it. And um, I went back and got a master's in ed psych. I really wanted to understand why my students were making the choices they made um, and just trying to understand that, you know, the whole psychology behind it. But what ended up happening is um, after the 10 years I worked at the lockup, I um, then transferred to North Farmington High School and I still worked with the same population. Um, they weren't in jail, these young adults, but um, you know, the gangs, um, they were in and out of hospitals, um, you know, runaways. It was the cream of the crop. I mean, it was the most severe behaviors. And if they couldn't make it there, they would go to a day treatment. And that first year I was there, my son, my youngest son, Anthony, was diagnosed with what they then called Asperger syndrome. Now everything's autism. But at the time, I was a special ed teacher. I'd been doing this for, at that, that time, about 15 years, and I'd never heard the word Asperger's. 
And w once I started delving into it, I, I, to be totally honest, I went into a deep depression. And, and I'm really, I want to be clear on this. It wasn't because, oh my God, my son has autism. It was because I knew what his future was. I knew how difficult this was going to be. I knew that when my parents' children got done with school, there was nothing out there and they were living in their parents' basement playing video games. And I just kept thinking, oh my God, this is his future. The other thing that kept happening, which, you know, I look back and I wonder if it was like, you know, God was, had a role in this. They didn't know what to do with their students that had Asperger's, so they were putting them in my classroom. And it was so inappropriate. Um, you know, you've got kids that are have severe behavioral issues, they're in there for a reason, and then you're putting people in, with Asperger's in that classroom. And my people are walking targets to be bullied, and now you've got them in the classroom with bullies. So that kind of triggered my depression too, thinking, oh my God, he, he's never gonna make it. And everything I looked into, I couldn't find anything. I mean, I could find services for him that were about an hour away, uh, very expensive, you know, health insurance didn't cover any of it, but it only went up to like 18. It, you know, they were, there was like nothing after they get done. And I started, you know, I did what every parent did. I researched it as much as I could, found any service I could and drove him to it. You know, several days a week we went to therapy and anything I could find. And um, I mean, there was one time I actually took a loan out to pay for his services, but you know, they, it was so expensive. and. And any parent that has a child with special needs, and I'm, I'm going to say especially autism, you were just like looking for that one thing. You know, you know, I would have did seances around him if they said that this is what's going to help him. I mean, you, there's a lot more information out now, but at the time there was very little. And what I decided to do was um, I picked myself up and I thought I was going through a divorce that year as well. And I thought, oh, my God, if if I die, this kid's going to be homeless. And that is what every parent that has a special needs child thinks about, what is gonna happen when I die. And I made the decision to go back to college and get a second master's in autism so I could advocate for him and understand it. So I'm working full time, I've got these boys, and I'm plucking away at these classes. And it you know, took me a few years, but I, I finished it. And then when I got done, I decided I was gonna run social skill groups um, in a library. So every Sunday I rented out the um, Farmington Public Library and I had social skill groups. Um, and what that basically is, you know, right around second grade, third grade, our our young, our people, most of our people that will be listening to this, if they have a child with special needs, especially autism, people start moving away from them. They, you know, they're a little bit quirky and, you know, your next door neighbor that you grew up with, all of a sudden, you know, he's growing, you know, growing out of the same things that person is going through. So they tend to, you know, move on and our kids get isolated. And, you know, they, and the other part about it is, which really kills me, is that they're aware enough to know that I'm not getting invited to parties or dates or, or anything, yet my older brother is, or my next door neighbor's doing these things. And, and they're in, in, in that in and of itself is so destructive, you know, it just feels horrible. And so these social skill groups was to help them make friends, um, but it was also to help them, you know, with their little idiosyncrasies. Like um, a lot of them are very, again, I don't want to stereotype, but a lot of them have a few different characteristics that, you know, yeah. that that all of them have. Um, like um, sarcasm. A lot of them, I, and I'm going to speak about my son, so so that I'm not going to, um, you know, violate sure. any hip hop. Uh, my son has a really hard time. He's very high functioning. If you looked at him, he presents well, you would not know. You might talk to him for a little bit and then go, something's a little different here. But, um, you know, he doesn't understand sarcasm, innuendos. Um, so we, I really worked with that with them. Um, greeting, eye contact, you know, uh, reciprocity in conversation, you know, that back and forth conversation. A lot of them are fabulous with talking and telling them, telling everyone about themselves, but they don't know how to, you know, that natural thing of asking questions and, and knowing that, okay, the person's looking at their watch, it's time to wrap this up. You know, they don't see things like that and it gets them in trouble a lot. So I, I did that for about two years and I didn't charge families. I did it for free and um, it kept growing. And I thought at the end of that two years, I thought I can just keep doing what I'm doing and 
you know, things are going smooth right now, but when he turns 18, I'm going to be in the same position as all of my family. So I took a huge leap of faith and I quit my job. Um, I was up to my pay scale. I had health insurance and I, I don't have money. And so what I decided to do was sell my home. My ex-husband and I had built this beautiful home. We, you know, my boys and I'd lived there. I'd lived there for 22 years and it was the only thing I could think of to raise money to do this. So I sold my home and I moved us into a very humble, humble home. And I say this now, but at the time I didn't tell anyone this. Um, about two years after we moved out, they bulldozed it down. That's how bad this was. And, you know, and I had so much guilt that I moved my kids out of their, you know, their home. But I, I just kept thinking, I don't, I can't, there's no other way I can do this. I've got to just risk it all. Thank God it worked. <laughs> but I, what I did is I opened up a little, I found a little storefront in downtown Northville and I had all this beautiful furniture for my, my house. And so I decorated it beautifully and I started with one program. It was, and we still have it. So one of our biggest programs, I called it uh, Friday night hangout. I wanted a place where these young adults that were more independent, had somewhere on Friday night they could go and they looked forward to it. I didn't want it to be in a church basement or a YMCA. I wanted it to be really cool and hip. And, you know, we order pizza and play games and we dance and, and I would embed the social skills in there. Um, what I knew was that every time I did take my son to a program, there was no one in these programs other than people that have special needs. And I kept looking at this thinking, there needs to be people in these groups for them to model what's appropriate or, you know, if I say to my son, you know, hey, you're, you need to comb your hair, he'll roll his eyes. But if a peer says it, you know, he'll go do it. It's a lot more powerful. So I made sure to get as many peers as I could that they were their age to volunteer to be, to just be friends with them in, those, in this program. And then the second thing was my son, when we would go into therapy or anything, he could master whatever they were doing, whatever the skill was they're teaching, but he couldn't do it anywhere else. And, and I think that's that autism, you know, um, very literal, you know, okay, I learned yeah. it here, I do it here. So the other thing I did, and, and, and going back on that a little bit, I mean, it is, I remember saying to, you know, the therapist, everything, you know, we're normally do it at other places. And, you know, they didn't have the answer, which, you know, I know it, it was very new then. Um, but I, can't, I couldn't live that way. Like, we've got to try some things. So I would teach a skill, maybe it was greeting, and then we would go, we'd walk around downtown Northville to the little coffee stores or grocery, you know, grocery stores or restaurants or bookstores, and we would practice that skill in several different places so that they could learn to generalize it, to do that skill everywhere. And it, it grew, um, you know, I then started a Saturday night hangout and then I added cooking classes and music classes. And a lot of our people have really unique interests. So I tried to um, incorporate clubs around there, around that. Cause I thought, okay, if, if other people come to this club, then they have that common interest. So that will help. So, I mean, we have bird watching. Now we have over 30 clubs. We have bird watching and Comic-Con clubs and gamers clubs and Dungeons and Dragons and theater clubs and cooking and summer camps and um, dance classes. We have so many classes. Um, but what I kept looking at, because my goal the entire time was, and I didn't know how to get there. It was like, okay, just doing this. But my still my goal was helping these people live the most meaningful life in as mo as 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 independent as they possibly can be. And so, you know, I'm trying to navigate this and I then started looking at all of them and none of them were working. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna work on the job piece because that will help us with the um, living. Mm -hmm. And I, I had no money to pay anyone. Um, so it was me and on Friday nights, my husband would help me. I remarried, my husband would help me. and. I would be doing job skills with them and coaching and taking them, you know, showing interview school skills and everything. So we started that. And since then we've employed over 50 people in the community that have paychecks. Wow. And then we've also got a vocational program for, you know, when they say it's a spectrum, you know, it, it's true. I mean, you've got people that have master's degrees that have autism and their problems are different from the other, from other people have autism, but it's, it's a problem and they need help with it. And then you've got your people that are, you know, I always say like certificate of completion. Like these are your people that um, 
didn't get a diploma, they went to school till they were 26 and got a certificate of completion. So they're always going to need a little bit more support. So we started a vocational program that is just skyrocketed. We've got, I think, over 50 people in this class now. And we've partnered with over 60 different local businesses. So every morning, all these young adults come to our center and then it's one direct care worker and three clients and they go to different job sites and then they come back for lunch and in the afternoon they go to a different job site. And and those a lot of the other thing with this population is that and I understand this, their parents have got them on social security and mm -hmm. completely understand why. And so they don't want them to get a paycheck because it'll interrupt that. So we've kind of solved that problem by okay, they're learning job skills but, but we're not, you know, they won't get paid. Um, a couple have though, a couple have like loved, you know, I've got this one client that, you know, one of our um, community businesses is Meadowbrook Golf Club, golf course and country club. And she got hired there and she loves it. So she is getting a paycheck, but you know, in that population that's few and far between. And then I've got my population that need the most support. And they're about 5% of the whole special needs population. They're the people that, you know, um, are nonverbal, that need assistance, um, walking, going to the bathroom, um, you know, need one-on-one -on -one support. And we've created one program, two programs for them, but we currently are re, um, trans, uh, forming one of our buildings on our property into a place that's accessible for them. And so they'll have their own vocational program. So, um, and then since then, um, you know, we've had a lot of God moments. I mean, I, and that's all I can say. It, it had to be God because I have no money and I never, I didn't even get a paycheck till last year. But um, we, you know, we outgrew our old facility. We moved into um, a historic house and beautiful house in downtown Northville. And we started doing programs there. And it was like the world all of a sudden took us seriously. And within yeah. four months, we outgrew that. Wow. Um, all of a sudden, people were coming from Downriver and Ypsilanti yeah. and Troy, and because some of the programs we have, no one has them. And I, I, and I know this because I looked for these programs, and if they, if they were out there, I would never have did this. It was because there was nothing out there. So within four months, like I said, we were in the same situation, and we were in a sure. meeting. Yes. Uh, I apologize. I have to uh, cut you off. We are just uh, we're just a little ways uh, above our our time here, so I, I do have to wrap up the show. Big I do apologize, but uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm it's just, okay. I'm it's, done. No, it's fine. It's all good information. I, I want to just want to make sure that we didn't go too far over. So I appreciate your time, and I want to make sure that I, I give people the information if they want to learn more about the Living and Learning Enrichment Center. They can visit livingandlearningcenter.org. Rochelle, thank you very much for joining us. You're so welcome. Appreciate it.